Hi, I'm Carlton Coffin. And I am Lena Roald, and in this bonus material related to our videos on convex relaxation and power system optimization, we have now um, come to the part which is about um, some work we've done on uh, which is moving towards robust AC optimal power flow, where we are kind of using band tightening in a different way. Okay, so this is a discussion or a presentation which is based on work uh, with Dan Moltzan. So if you're interested in knowing more about this, you can go and look for this paper. And then I'm going to start about kind of explaining what is the problem we're looking at. And uh, a lot of work in power systems these days is really motivated by the rise of renewable energy and uncertainty that comes along with renewable energy. So here on this slide, it's a little picture of um, wind uh, forecasts and the real-time value of wind during four days in November 2016 in the, in the German transmission system operator Tenet, Germany. And as you can tell when you look at this, it kind of looks like, oh, they are doing a pretty good job uh, in forecasting the wind because you can really see how there is this, I mean, the, the real-time value is really kind of following the ups and downs uh, of the real-time value. Uh, and the forecast, they, they overlap pretty well here. But if you look at this a little bit closer, you see when at this point where the red arrow is that the difference here is really four gigawatts. So it's a quite substantial amount of power that is missing in real time relative to the forecast. And when we're looking at that, I mean here, this is really the most updated wind forecast that the system operator had available. Um, so we understand that there is some uncertainty here that comes into play with regards to how much wind is there going to be on the system. And this is of course only looking at the total amount of wind. Um, there could be a different case where you know wind might be somewhere in the system where you thought it would not be and on a different place in the system it might be lacking. So there is really something about, this is telling us we really need to deal with that uncertainty somehow. I'm curious, I noticed that the real-time wind value seems to be below typically the forecasted value. Is that by design? Uh, no, I don't think so. Just I think this is just coincidence. Mm -hmm. uh, so, And you see the timeline here is for four days. It's from November 2016. I don't think they uh, specifically do that. Okay. Um, but maybe. I, I don't know. I would ex expect them to try, try to have the best value possible. But it's reasonable to assume the methods you're going to be talking about don't require a pessimistic or an optimistic forecast. Yeah, no. Actually, the method I'm going to talk about here is it. all it really requires is um, sort of a bounded uncertainty set. So you can, you can have any kind of uncertainty. You just need to be able to say, okay, uh, my uncertainty is sort of going to move within this space, and you need to be able to mathematically describe that space within which the uncertainty will happen. Okay, so that brings us sort of to the problem we are looking at. So th th this gives rise to these problems which are robust and stochastic versions of the AC optimal power flow. So to look at this a little bit more in detail, um, what we mean when we say robust and stochastic uh, is that we really want to have security against those uncertain injections. So we want to make sure that whatever solution we come up with is going to be able to handle um, those uns this uncertainty in a safe manner. When we talk about AC uh, power flow, uh, we are assuming that we have a system where we need a rel relatively accurate system model that also accounts for voltages and reactive power, which means that we really want to take into account the nonlinear equations that are describing the AC power flow um, and which gives rise to non convex constraints in our optimization problem. And then finally, we want to, to look at AC optimal power flow because we really would like to have the optimal solution because that guarantees us some kind of economic efficiency um, for our operations. Now, I would uh, note here that the topic of robust optimization and stochastic optimization are very widely studied in the optimization community, but integrating those methods with non-convex constraints is a very much an open challenge, yes. uh, and which makes this topic of research uh, very challenging, but also very exciting. Yeah, so that is, uh, yeah, that is why this presentation was actually called Towards uh, <laughs> AC, uh, Robust AC Optimal Power Flow, uh, because, be, because of exactly that, that most, um, um, mo most methods from the optimization community are really looking at robust and stochastic convex problems. Uh, we have some challenges here because of these non-convexities. 
Um, so actually, <laughs> and I wrote here as of as of December two thousand and seventeen, there was no known methods uh, that could guarantee both robust security and optimality subject to AC feasibility constraints. And I mean, at least this is to the very best of our knowledge. Uh, me and Dan, we were looking quite thoroughly to to see if we could find something, um, and. I'm going to mention a few methods that are out there. So there are certain people who have looked into how can we look at robustness here in terms of looking into worst case scenario for non-convex AC optimal power flow. There's a very nice paper from 2012 which is looking into this. Um, and the problem here is that although this seems to work very well in practice, there are really no guarantees uh, due to the non-convexity of the problem. Um, there are other papers which are looking into uh, using linearized version of the AC power flow equations uh, to represent kind of what is happening there with voltages and reactive power, um, and which is obviously more accurate than if you use a DC approximation, which is more common in literature. Uh, but you can only expect these, uh, these methods to be accurate close to the linearization point, and if you do have large amounts of uncertainty, this might become inaccurate. Um, there are also other methods that are using convex relaxation plus the linearization of the voltage products. But there is also, again, as we have mentioned in our previous lectures, there are some questions here about whether these methods are really able to um, capture, I mean, will they be exact? And, and there are some questions um, uh, surrounding that. Um, there's a, also a recent paper which is looking at the conver convex inner approximation of the nodal, nodal power balance constraints, but this is really a little bit tricky because it doesn't really tackle this challenge of handling the equality constraints. So although this is a good step in the right direction, um, it is not so practically viable to require controllable injections at every bus, because at many nodes you really need to satisfy a certain demand. Um, then there is a, also another series of papers which are using convex relaxations to solve sort of two or multi-stage robust programs. And these are kind of interesting because one of the things that those methods provide us with is guarantees, guaranteed lower bounds. So we can say that, okay, we have a lower bound on our solution here. Um, and this tells us that at least if we have a, another solution, we can kind of at least say something about it. this. This is a good, this is a lower bound, and we can use that to benchmark. And this is this lower bound would be on the objective function, the operating point. Yes, yes. Uh, given all of the robust guarantees that you want to have. Yes, exactly. So it both it does not really provide thorough robust guarantees. Mm -hmm. It is relaxing the robust guarantees, mm -hmm. which is why you will always get a lower bound on your mm -hmm. sub-problem, so your second or, or further down the road stages. Mm -hmm. um, and then as you're propagating this back up into your master problem, that, mm -hmm. that, that will still also, you're guaranteed that that objective value is a lower bound, which will give you a lower bound on the overall problem. So that yeah. is kind of how that lower bound works. So already that is, is a very, it's, it's not, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a good thing to have. Um, what we are looking at here is actually a different problem slightly. Um, we are really looking to uh, achieve robust feasibility guarantees. So we care here sort of more about having robust feasibility rather than optimality, because we are saying, okay, if we are slightly suboptimal, maybe we care less about that than being robust, robust feasi robustly feasible. Um, but another important part of this is that if we are able to provide thorough robust feasibility guarantees, we can also guarantee that we have an upper bound on our problem. So then we can start playing with these things of having you know, an upper bound and a lower bound, and we can say how far are they apart. So that's the direction we are going in here. Okay, so let's look a little bit on the problem formulation we are using here. So we have this kind of little system over here where on some bus we have this uh, uncertain um, generator. And the variations, we are, we, we are modeling our uh, variations in active power injections due to f uh, renewable forecast errors as this uh, green variable omega. So the total injection from a random, uh, or from, from, for example, a renewable energy source is modeled as some kind of a, a forecasted value, P injection, plus this uh, omega value. Uh, we are assuming that those um, uncertain injections have a constant power factor, so that means that the ratio between active and reactive power is remain, uh, will remain constant. So that's modeled here. You see there's only one random variable for both of them. Um, and we are assuming that our omegas lie in a box uncertainty set. So this is 
kind of as a first step. I mean, there would be many possible uh, generalizations that are possible here. So this is just like one choice of a model. You could also model uh, loads that do not have constant power factors, and you can also model different uh, uncertainty sets. Okay, so then we are looking into how do we model balancing and voltage control in this setting. So for active power, we are really assuming that we have something like the automatic generation control, uh, or is, which is activating secondary reserves in order to balance the system when we have those fluctuations omega. And this is, assumption is sort of indicating that we are looking at short-term uncertainty. On a longer time scale, uh, it might be more reasonable to assume that you would resolve the OPF and do a new market clearing. Here we are really looking at kind of uncertainty that happened on a shorter time interval. So that's why this, this is a good model. Um, and what you can uh, see here is that we, uh, we uh, um, model our actual generation from, of active power as the sum between the scheduled generation minus some correction. And that correction is um, given by uh, the power mismatch, which is listed in red. So that is the sum of all the omegas in the system. So this is to total power mismatch due to renewable fluctuations. And then we have a change in the losses which is also modeled here as this delta P of omega. Uh, and this total power mismatch, which consists of both the renewable and this change in the power losses, is, are, are, uh, is um, divided among the generators according to their specified participation factors. So this is just like kind of a typical model for modeling balancing in, um, of active power in power systems. Uh, getting into reactive power, what we are uh, doing here is that we are assuming that we have certain PV buses where the generators are changing their reactive power injections in order to, to keep the voltage magnitudes constant. So there's a scheduled voltage set points here in green, and that the buses which are PV buses, we are going to um, keep that voltage magnitude constant. Um, for uh, for in this case, we also do have um, um, limits on the reactive power generation of the uh, generators. So we kind of need to make sure that we are able to choose this voltage set point such that we are able to keep it constant within this uh, range of reactive power that we have. Uh, we are that that uh, specifically means that we are actually not modeling PV PQ bus switching. So if a generator is at this max, we are kind of uh, we, we need to be a bit careful. Okay, so the network model we are using here is the nonlinear AC power flow equation. So I'm just going to list them here. This is here they are in their polar form, and you see that we also are um, have this reference bus where we are assuming that the or we are set where we are setting the voltage angle to zero. Okay, so to get to the full formulation, and um, what we are the problem we are really solving here is a problem where we are minimizing the cost of the expected operating point. So we are assuming that the the um, the, the uh, changes that happens due to the fluctuations and reserve activation, we are not explicitly modeling the cost of that, although that could also be included. Um, then we have this generation and voltage control policies that we were just describing. Um, we have the AC power flow equations, uh, and uh, we have a set of engineering constraints where we are, uh, which represents the generation voltage and transmission limits in the system. Okay, so this is the type of formulation we want to solve or the problem you're trying to solve and it is a really challenging problem. Why, what is it that makes this more challenging than the AC, the deterministic AC optimal power flow problem? Well, first of all, what we are asking for here is to have robustness against all uncertainty realizations. So all of this, uh, or these constraints in the problem should really um, hold for any realization of the uncertainty within this set, uh, set W. Um, one of the key challenges then is to ensure that all of those uh, uh, constraints uh, remain feasible um, during for all of those uncertainty realizations. And another challenge is to guarantee that these AC power flow equations, which are describing how voltages and generation will change when we are applying our generation and voltage control policies for a given um, a realization of omega, that all of those equations will actually always have a solution. If we knew that they always had a solution, they would just be sort of the mapping between omega and all the other values, since we know that there is cases where we are able to specify power injections for which those are actually not solvable, it's a little bit more tricky. 
And actually, it's so tricky that for the purposes of this uh, presentation, we are not going to consider exactly that problem. Uh, that is really uh, ongoing work. Um, can I ask a question here? So, as I understand it, uh, the set of W is actually an infinite set. Mm -hmm. So it's not like you could just enumerate all the W's and check them explicitly. You need something even more powerful than that. Exactly, exactly. Uh, so that is that is absolutely true. Um, you could imagine if this was a... I mean, yeah. So, so this is really an uh, infinite dimensional problem. You have an infinite number of constraints and you have an... I mean, the omega can take uh, on any, any type of... Uh, and that's because the uncertainty set you selected was this box, which is a continuous range. So there's just like yeah. an infinite amount of um, vectors within those boxes. Yes, exactly. And we should also note here that, you know, even if, since this is an unconvex problem, we cannot just look at the corner of the boxes mm -hmm. and make this, um, and, and assume that everything in between is going to be fine. Mm -hmm. Even though we are sort of, I guess, I mean, we have a box here, so we have a co convex uncertainty set. Mm -hmm. Okay. So all of this um, is so this so what I'm really now now going to go into is just what how are we thinking about ensuring feasibility of all of the engineering constraints in this problem? Okay, um, so the general idea here is that really what we want to do is that we want to limit sort of the minimum and maximum values that those constraints can take on. So we are going to use here as an example this current constraint. So we are saying that the magnitude of the current needs to stay below a certain level. And we could, you know, uh, given that constraint, we can replace it by this type of maximization problem. So we can say that what we really want to do is that we want to maximize the, uh, the current magnitude. We will want to find the largest current magnitude that we are able to get for any omega within our uncertainty set. So if we do this for all of our constraints that um, depend on omega and all of the engineering constraints, what we can really see is that, okay, we, we went from having this... Um, number like this uh, these constraints which are really i mean an infinite number of constraints to to at least now we have a sort a given number of constraints that we need to take into account so these maximization maximization problems in order to solve them we also need to take into the account uh, into account the constraints that comes in this problem so that would be the ac power flow constraints and also our voltage uh, and uh, balancing policies down here and what I really want to note here when we are looking at this is that our optimization variables here are really these green variables. And I can maybe even go uh, back and look at that here. I mean, really, the main optimization variables in this problem are these green variables, the expected operating point. That is really what we are interested in uh, optimizing over. So when we are coming in here and we are looking at that, we see those uh, green variables again in here. Um, and then we are, in, in this problem, while we have fixed those green variables, um, we are now trying to optimize over these, these uh, uh, omegas to find the worst case omega for our problem. Okay, so this is now a really hot problem that is very hard to solve. And in particular, it's hard to solve because of these, uh, the non-convex AC power flow constraints. Um, and what we do is that instead of uh, incorporating those constraints, we really replace them by a set of convex relaxations. So in this case, what we are doing is that we obtain, we are, we are using this uh, to obtain a conservative estimate, so where really we are finding a too high max value because we are relaxing the problem. Um, in order, the convex relaxation we are using here is a combined semi-definite and QC relaxation, and we are using iterative bond tightening techniques similar to what um, we were describing previously in order to get as tight bounds as possible. So we want to be as little, um, ha have as good approximation as possible. So really, what we are doing is that we are solving this problem for each of the constraints in the in the in in the in our problem and then we are obtaining tighter bounds on our variables as we go along. One thing we really need to uh, make sure here is that another thing I would like to note here um, is that in when we look at this problem what you can see is that uh, in addition to replacing uh, the AC power flow constraints by the convex relaxation another thing that is important to note is that we actually don't have our standard engineering constraints here. There are no constraints on the generation limits, there are no constraints on the, um, 
on the voltage uh, limits and there are no constraints on the power flows. So this is just in order to make sure that we are not sort of implicitly assuming that other constraints will be satisfied when we are trying to evaluate the maximum and minimum values. We really want to see like what is the worst case we can do given this green operating point that we found for omega equal to zero. However, we need to include one additional constraint here, and that is that we need to make sure that we are not including low voltage solutions in our pro problem space. So low voltage solutions um, can happen and they should also be covered and be part of the solution space covered by the convex relaxations. So we really, really need to try and cut them off in this case because of that, uh, yeah. So for those who are interested in this, I would like to refer you to the paper I mentioned at the beginning. Okay, so really what we do is that we solve this problem and then we repeat the for all the constraints and that is where we are doing then this iterative bound typing. Okay, so let's say we now, so now we have this, we have this kind of problem, okay, and we are trying uh, to incorporate these max of um, over the current smaller than the limit subject to all of those constraints as a constraint in our bigger problem. And this is not very efficient. We have very many of those constraints and they would make the problem really, really complicated to solve. So there, this kind of raises the question, is there an efficient way to try and solve this problem now? So, um, and at least we have a way of solving it, which is reasonably, um, which, is, which is reasonable, which provides solutions to us in a reasonable amount of time, at least on um, standard test cases. Um, and what we do is really that we take this constraint and we interpret it as a constraint tightening. So instead now of looking at the example constraint from above, where we are like of this maximum of i smaller than uh, i max, uh, we are looking at we, we include a constraint in our original problem for the, the for the zero omega point, and we say that we want our sort of nominal current for omega equal to zero to be small enough such that. Um, our, it, is, it is below our um, maximum current limit and even lower than that by some tightening lambda i ln. And, and, yeah. and here omega zero is like the nominal, the forecasted operating point? Uh, yes, omega zero. Omega zero is the forecasted operating point, okay. exactly. And so this constraint tightening lambda is then defined as the difference between the maximum current we can observe and the scheduled current. So there's nominal current for omega equal to zero. And we can see that if we define lambda and we already calculate lambda and we take this as a constant into our problem, then really that constraint above there um, only depends on the scheduled variables for omega equal to zero. So clearly here, the blue lambda is a function also of um, of the scheduled current, and then it has this uh, maximization problem in there. Um, but then, if we would calculate lambda separately, we could we can incorporate this as sort of a constraint tightening in our deterministic problem, and that is exactly um, how we are going to uh, go about uh, solving the problem. So essentially. What we are starting from, so the problem we are going to start from is the following one. So we have, uh, and we are going to use this as to solve it, the problem using an iterative solution algorithm. So essentially we have this problem over here where we now have a deterministic AC uh, power flow, uh, uh, deterministic AC optimal power flow problem, where we have replaced all, um, where we have uh, taken away the network constraint for all omega in our uncertainty set and replaced them only by for omega zero. And this is where we are assuming that power flow solvability is not an issue, and we assume that this is taken care of in a separate step. And then we have all those um, engineering constraints down here. So what we really do is that we solve this problem that you see here for a deterministic as a deterministic optimal power flow problem for a fixed lambda. Then, given the solution that we get for the uh, PGs and uh, uh, and the voltages and the currents and everything, we evaluate those um, tightenings of the constraints. 
And we repeat this for all of the constraints, not only for our example constraint. And then we, continue, we go back and we resolve the AC optimal power flow problem for that fixed lambda. And then we go back and resolve uh, the tightening problem. And we go back and forth and go back and forth until we have found a secure solution. And we consider the solution to be secure when the tightening stops changing between subsequent iterations. So essentially, all of the tightenings in the problem need to fall below a uh, specified threshold, and then we can say, stop, our solution is good. So what I'm thinking as you describe this algorithm is kind of like computing a restriction of the feasibility set that's subject to the uncertainty set omega, or w, mm -hmm. um, that it's like... A, instead of computing it analytically, you're like iteratively computing it through this algorithm. Is mm. that a reasonable interpretation? Yeah, I think it is a relatively reasonable, yeah, it is a reasonable interpretation um, that you are really trying to, rest, you, you are limiting your feasibility set um, more than, than, yeah. You are, you are trying to kind of find the right restriction for your uh, mm. feasibility set, um, which is a reduction of the original feasibility set. Um, we should also note here that when we solve the deterministic AC optimal power flow problem, we are really solving the full non-convex problem. So it is certainly a non-convex um, problem at, at the top there, um, which is again important because otherwise we might, if we would relax this problem, we might have, um, we might run into issues with that. Uh, that being a relaxation again. Mm -hmm. Okay, so. Let's say we do try and do this, um, and one thing you might now ask me is there, okay, but does this, gar uh, but this, does this converge? And there are actually no guarantees for convergence. <laughs> and we have shown that uh, in a paper that it is not possible to guarantee that this will converge, because particularly if you have disconnections in your feasible space, and the solution jumps a lot between iterations, then this you might end up in a case where you're jumping back and forth between uh, two points. Uh, there are also no guarantees that you are actually going to find the right optimal solution, or at least not that we know of. This is also something we're trying to understand better. Uh, the positive part is, is it really works surprisingly well. So we have seen uh, on the problems we are solving that typically this converges within, let's say, five iterations or less. Um, in a more extensive testing uh, for a chance-constrained uh, ACOPF, which had a very related algorithm, um, this was found. Uh, this this algorithm was found to actually find similar um, optimal points as trying to solve uh, a variant of this problem as a one-shot problem. Um, and of course, we cannot say that this is going to hold true in general. But from all the testing we have done, we really we are kind of surprised why does it work so well. So we are, that is one of the things we are trying to currently understand. Okay, so that is how we are using relaxations here in order to try to tighten our constraints in a conservative way um, and, yeah, um, and, find, uh, and find a, re a restriction to our problem that will guarantee robust uh, feasibility. So yeah, to give you some um, idea about how this works, here is a simple case study on a six bus system. So here we are assuming that we have three generators, three loads, we have equal participation factors, and we have five, plus minus 5% uncertainty in each load demand. And when we start out solving this in the first iteration, when we solve it for the um, deterministic problem, what we have is really the feasible space that you see over here. So this is the feasible space of the problem projected down into a 2D plane where you have the two, two currents on two different lines in this system. So these are the lines marked in red over there. And what you see is that on, the, on one of the lines um, on the vertical axis, there is really an active constraint. So there is this black line which represents the li line above which we would have a too high current on this line. And if we solve the deterministic problem, uh, what we are going to find is that the solution of the deterministic problem really lies on that constraint. So it's pushing the system to go all the way up to the constraint in order to mm. push as much power from the cheap generators to the loads. Um, and then when we now evaluate the solution for different uncertainty realization, what we observe are the red dots over here. Um, and you see that in many cases, we now have a too high current. So there are uh, uncertainty realization that lead to violations of this constraint. So as we are running our algorithm, what is really happening is that we are tightening the constraint. 
And this is the final tightening of that constraint. So there have been a couple of iterations in between here. Um, and the constraint is really being pushed down. So you see that it's tightened by a certain amount. And now we, uh, our optimal solution lands where this blue star is after we have tightened the region. Uh, and what we actually observe is that when we look at that star solution and we evaluate for all of our uncertainty realizations, you see that this cloud of realizations around the star, they are actually all below this constraint, so we never end up with two high currents. Okay, so another thing to note here for the IEEE 14 bus system, one thing is that, of course, the tightenings we are observing, they are increasing with increasing uncertainty because as the uncertainty is increasing, your, uh, your power flow and, and currents can move further away from the scheduled operating point. Um, however, although the tightenings are increasing, when we are looking at our um, reactive power and current magnitudes that we see, um, the, we absolutely actually observe that the relaxation gives pretty good bounds here, they are not overly conservative. So what you see here on the black lines is that the uh, tightenings themselves are increasing for the, the various uh, generators and the various lines, but really the kind of the conservativeness as we have evaluated it for this case is really remaining more or less constant. So the, the meaning that um, we do not see these enormously bad uh, behavior of the relaxation where it is cheating a lot. So that is a good, that is good news. Also, of course, because of the um, bounds, um, uh, because the uh, tightenings increase with increasing uncertainty, it is as expected that the cost also will increase with the size of the uncertainty set. So I'm curious, uh, if you increase the uncertainty set sufficiently high, there may be situations where the network's totally overloaded and there's no like you know reasonable yeah. state. Yeah. Um, what happens then? Well, this problem goes invisible. Okay. So actually, what what is here? If you this is the fourteen bus case here is kind of nice because you are actually able to push it, push the uncertainty level very high. If you have a more constrained system in the mm -hmm. first place, you you typically will uh, get into invisibility before that. And um, and there are different various reasons for why does invisibility happen here. Um, in our algorithm, it's actually a problem that you cannot guarantee. I mean, if you get an infeasible solution at any intermediate point, you, it's hard to tell something about whether or not the problem is actually really infeasible. Mm. Um, another challenge here is that we are not modeling this PVPQ bus switching, which constrains the problem more than it really would in a, in a real case. So this is relatively conservative um, formulation of the problem, mm. and it's really kind of designed to try and deal, the, the methods are really tried, trying to dis, deal with this problem of providing robust feasibility guarantees. Um, right. And in near-term integration, you know, the uncertainty won't be so high. So yeah, yeah. These types of approaches might be viable for um, near-term penetration of renewables and demand response. Yeah, exactly. So, exactly. Although, you know, the um, renewable energy penetration might become very high, it is not necessarily <laughs> so that the short-term forecast uncertainty is going to um, be incredibly much higher than it okay. is today. So, I mean, I don't know. It will... I mean, if there isn't a larger error margin, you can certainly have, if you re make it a really bad forecast, uh, it mm. is a more problematic. Mm. Okay, well, so that is uh, essentially it. So to conclude, um, what I have shown you here is, uh, I've been trying to show you that there are we are working towards ways of guaranteeing robust feasibility of the AC optimal power flow problem. This is a really challenging problem because it is a robust um, problem which is non-convex, and so this is not very standard uh, type of problem to look at for robustness. Um, there are, we, we are kind of splitting this challenge into two parts. So we are looking at satisfaction of engineering constraints, so guaranteeing that um, none of our current constraints, generator constraints, and voltage constraints will be violated. And then there is a second part of this, which is really guaranteeing that there is always a solution to the AC power flow equations. And that, I would say, is sort of ongoing work. There has been uh, interesting, there's a lot of interesting things going on in this area, um, so hopefully we should soon be able to find good solutions there as well. Um, then what kind of a key part of this is that we are trying in this uh, method to obtain conservative estimates of the maximum and minimum constraint value uh, by using combination of convex relaxation and iterative optimization based bound tightening. 
Uh, and these are kind of things, that's why this um, we, we present this here, because this is heavily related to how to our other presentations here. Um, and this is really important here, because we are using a very non-standard objective function. We really need to use all these combinations of convex relaxations in order to get relaxations that give reasonable uh, solutions back to us. Otherwise, if we would just use one type of convex relaxation, we might end up with very, very bad uh, and non-tight um, solutions because we are really trying to, ma you know, maximize the current on the line. That can be. There are many relaxations that are brilliant at cheating in that case. Okay. So another one is that um, uh, another thing we were aiming at here is to guarantee that our results will really be robustly feasible. Um, as long as our AC power flow solution exists. Um, however, I mean, the results we have shown here, they can be conservative and suboptimal. Um, so this is an important point to be aware of. Um, and also, uh, there are no guarantees on convergence of this iterative method. But we observe that it works very well in practice. So yeah, so that's it. Um, hopefully, uh, was useful. and uh, I found it very useful. Okay, that's good. <laughs>